I think this moment in time is different. This election at a very, very macro level is different because people feel much less certain than they have in a very, very long time. The polarization today is not unprecedented, uh, but Democrats around the country uh, threaten to raise uh, armies of Union Army veterans. Uh, they, they said, we can get 100,000 men and we'll march on Washington and, and uh, use force to make sure that uh, Tilden uh, is sworn in. Hi, everybody. This is John Donvan. And I want to say something about this moment that we're in, by which I mean November 3rd, 2020, Election Day, and the hours and days that have followed it. Have we ever lived through anything like this before with things like record mail-in voting and uncertainty about the polls now and social unrest in the atmosphere and all of this polarization and all of this in the middle of a pandemic where we have to be using technology to vote in a way that we never have been before? Can we say that this is an election without precedent? So that's what we're going to be looking at today. I'm going to be bringing two somewhat competing perspectives on whether, in fact, the 2020 U.S. presidential election was unprecedented. We're going to have one perspective that looks at it from the point of view of past history, and the other one that's going to be looking at it from the future. Well, not really from the future, but we're going to be hearing from a futurist who will give a perspective uh, that I don't think you're going to have heard before. So just a reminder, you can listen to all of our series by visiting us online at iq2us.org. That's iq, the number two, us.org. All right, let's get started. We're going to be starting with this argument, as I said before, from the future, by which I mean we're going to be talking with Amy Webb, who is one of the nation's leading futurists, and she's also an author and the founder of the Future Today Institute. And Amy is looking at the technology that was involved and is involved in our lives and making the argument that we have never had an election where the algorithms affected so much the way that we think, talk, and behave. That's where we're starting. Amy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, John. We have talked beforehand about your argument that in, in really significant ways, there has never been an election like this one, and that much of that has to do with the technology. So make your case on that. Right. So, you know, as a futurist, um, I spend equal parts looking forward and back in order to spot patterns, emerging forces, and signals of change. But I also do this with the knowledge that the world is constantly changing. So just because a pattern existed before does not mean that it explains something that's happening today. Um, as a futurist, I use two sets of factors. Uh, some of those are external. These are areas over which no one entity has total domination. These would be things like national disasters, natural, <laughs> that was Freudian, right? Um, natural yeah, yeah. disasters, <laughs> uh, shifts in geoeconomics, you know, countries don't have a uh, total say in, in what happens with trade, for example. Uh, and our countries are now working together with, uh, with shifts in ethics and values, but also certain types of social movements, uh, which today are decentralized and don't have a clear singular leader as we might have seen with a Mussolini or a Pinochet. So that's external factors. The other kinds of factors that we consider are what we call controllable. And these are factors over which somebody, uh, a company, a regulator, a political party, can exert control in a way that can meaningly influence an outcome. The 2020 election is historic and unprecedented because it breaks free from the established historical patterns. But you have to apply the right framing to see what's different. So... Um, I think this moment in time is, uh, is somewhat analogous to the late 1800s when um, Westinghouse, Edison, and Tesla were in the process of discovering how to bring electricity indoors. Edison's associates spread misinformation. They, had the, they led these crazy, super compelling misinformation campaigns um, as a part of a scheme to discredit Westinghouse and Tesla, who'd invented something called alternating current. Uh, Edison systems uh, used direct current, and alternating current turned out to be, you know, a better, a better system. Um, some other key factors were in play at around the same time. Uh, a moving sidewalk had debuted not too, uh, not too much earlier at the World's Fair, and although it seems not all that exciting to us to have somebody going two miles an hour on a moving walkway. And that was kind of mind-bending back then. Um, mm -hmm. And they people were afraid 
they thought women shouldn't ride on them because of their very long skirts. It, it, it might kill them if they try to disembark imp- improperly. Um, so anyhow, By the way, that sidewalks. does not sound like such a crazy concern <laughs> given the accidents that have actually happened in the real world. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we had moving sidewalks. We've got electricity indoors. Um, you know, Edison's going around telling people that, uh, or he wasn't, but some of his associates that um, electricity was in fact dangerous and it could kill people. We had the advent of the automobile making its way into streets. So people were scared. Um, and and this is actually when modern science fiction was born. H.G. Wells started writing prolifically. Uh, and 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 what's important here is that all of all you know a century ago, all of these different factors laid the groundwork for people being really concerned, uh, and they were concerned about their futures. But what makes this moment in time so different is that the technologies and the science are autonomous. They're programmable. Um, they're capable of making decisions without a human in the loop. We are on the precipice of artificial intelligence and something called synthetic biology, which gives us the the ability to engineer new life forms and to actually program life as though it was computer code. And the stories that have preceded these technologies are visceral. They've the movies have been made about them. And so people are uneasy. They also potentially lead to, to tangible job loss. And it calls into question what we think of religion and spirituality and what we believe. So I think this moment in time is different. This election at a very, very macro level is different because people feel much less certain than they have um, in a very, very long time. And that makes us dangerously vulnerable because in a way, we're emotionally addicted to certainty. And people are looking for decisiveness and for answers. And that set a totally different stage for the 2020 election. So it's this great social unease that you say is generated by an explosion of technology, some of which we can talk about in a moment, that is that is unique to some of the things that happened during the 2020 election campaign. That That's your, that's your argument. I have that correct? Yeah. And I think if we look at some of the controllable forces, um, uh-huh. you know, we we would we would have to look at platforms uh, and social media and the ways in which t- information moves around. So if you go back to the election between FDR and Ho- Herbert Hoover, there were there had to have been conspiracy theories abound about whether or not something was wrong with Roosevelt. By then, he had already contracted polio; he'd survived it, but it left him partially paralyzed and he couldn't walk easily. Um, at that point in time, um, you know, media was still relatively consolidated. We had radio, we had newspapers, we had magazines. Um, and it wasn't easy for anybody to say anything they wanted um, it, on a very public stage. And there was also a general understanding that you didn't talk about somebody else's business. Uh, you didn't talk about somebody else's illness or, or whatever. Um, you know, and Eleanor, uh, who, was a, who was brilliant, and a dedicated public servant and had a heart of gold uh, and was an incredibly smart strategic thinker, you know, um, it's been widely understood, it was then, it is now, um, that her most intimate relationships were with women. Uh, She had a devoted platonic relationship with her husband, and yes, they had five children, but it was very obvious that she was a lesbian. I've been thinking a lot about FDR and about Eleanor in the past few years, and if all things were the same, right? So if, Ameri- if, if we were to go back in time with Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, different messaging boards on the web, if we were to teleport all of that back to the time when FDR was in office um, and all other variables were the same, America was still feeling the aftermath of a Great Depression. There was the rise of nationalism, um, you know, a... a um, a lot of anti-Semitism, a- anti-Semitism that was spreading, the U.S. entering World War II, women entering the workforce for the first time. Um, I have to ask, would he have been elected if these other systems had been in place? He was among the greatest American presidents, thanks in no small part to Eleanor. But if YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook had existed, it's unlikely he would have. he would have been... You know, he would have seen those third and fourth terms. And and that's because of conspiracy theories. 
Conspiracy theories spread fast on social media, and that's another big difference in 2020. Wild stories about secret operatives working for both Republicans and Democrats, QAnon and Antifa. You know, the problem is that our brains process stories better than logical arguments or raw data. Um, and the places where these terrifying stories are spread are designed to hook our attention, the platforms. In, just so I, in, uh, just, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. So just so I understand the, the terms you're setting for the argument that uh, a social media atmosphere such as we have today, if it were transported back to 1936, would have killed off any chances for FDR to, to win in maybe even a second uh, election, third or fourth, not to mention third or fourth. You're, one of the things you're keeping holding equal are the social mores of the time. Because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, well, you know, That's there's right. an awful lot of stuff coming out on Twitter and it's not keeping people from getting elected to office nowadays because the standards have fallen so much. So one of the things you're saying we would have had to keep in place were the standards, the social standards and mores of the 1930s. That's right. And I think you are somewhat alluding to um, the information that came to light uh, during the 2016 election about our current president's proclivities um, and some of the insensitivities he showed toward women. You know, we're talking about somebody who, at the time, uh, you know, had a hard time walking, and that would have been seen as a sign of weakness, and whose wife uh, was was different. I mean, the, 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 the differences that they represented would not have been seen as assets. Um, and, and But more to the point, these are the, exactly the types of salacious bits of information that would have quickly spread and probably morphed from tiny little nuggets of truth to wild speculation, wild stories, mm-hmm. um, right? So, so we know that platforms have played a significant role in stoking fears, changing minds, inciting violence, and that brings us to today. So algorithms... Uh, in 2012, let's say, uh, 2016, you know, by that point, they had been configured to maximize attention. Um, YouTube engineers, uh, among others, made changes to their algorithms to drive more retention through hyper-personalized recommendations. Um, And what started to happen was that the content that veered into conspiracy theory turned out to be quite popular. And uh, the algorithms that were in place were steering people to videos that were, you know, hyperpartisan, divisive, and in some cases, really, really terrifying. In 2016, um, on YouTube, the channel that was most recommended to viewers was from conspiracy theorist Alex Jones. And actually, conspiracy theorist is uh, is dramatically underselling what it was that he was peddling at the time. Um, I think YouTube recognized that that was a problem. Jones, uh, Alex Jones was spreading lies, inciting violence. In fact, some of what he said very likely led to some people being killed and made changes. So here we are in the year 2020. And what's different? Um, Alex Jones is no longer on YouTube. And some of the, the most damaging content is being in some way cloaked or shielded um, by Facebook and by Twitter. I would just say one last thing on this. In FDR's time, and certainly pre, you know, pre-2000, there used to be an intermediary. There was an editor or a producer that intervened um, in, in how information was disseminated. Presidents did not just directly talk to the people anytime they felt like it. Um, FDR certainly talked on the radio, but it's, it's not like every five seconds he could, he could post a sentence or two about whatever he thought. Um, you know, we... So, so we're living in a situation where those traditional intermediaries, those humans, um, don't really exist or function in the same way that they used to. We do have intermediaries in 2016, and they are algorithms. That's what makes 2020 different, because now these algorithms have been trained. They are strong. Uh, they are incredibly good at what they do. And they're designed to execute on a stated goal. They don't change direction like a human editor would midway through. Humans are more nuanced. Um, You know, our current president has had a direct line of open communication with the electorate through Twitter. And while the majority of Americans do not use Twitter, the people who create media do. 
So you see his comments reverberating whether or not they are correct, whether or not they are spreading conspiracy or misinformation. You see that happening unfettered. That has shifted how people think. So I'd like you to close the argument where you have described these circumstances uh, that in which this election took place as being unprecedented for uh, primarily the existence and power of these algorithms that have never been more sophisticated than they are right now. So to what end, in terms of their impact on our present election that is unprecedented? What is different about the election that we just went through? What is different about us or our politics as a result of the interplay of these algorithms? The main difference is that people feel simultaneously validated in some of the thoughts that they would never have shared publicly with others and feel empowered to pursue the nuggets of those beliefs. We are seeing that in early results right now. This was not a blue wave for Biden. Uh, This was a very close election. And to the extent that people woke up on Wednesday morning and were shocked because the polls looked different than what they had expected, it's important to bear in mind that the way that we measure people's opinions and ideas no longer meshes with the ways in which they are learning new behaviors and how to think and what information to believe in. And that is the direct result of algorithmic determinism. That is... Uh, how algorithms deliver content to people in ways that maximize their attention. Hmm. So are you saying that we have never before had an electorate that was so badly, not underinformed, but misinformed? Mm-hmm. Is, th- is this new and unique and distinctive? Well, as somebody who works with data for a living, having not seen any studies of how informed or not informed um, previous electorates were. I can't answer that question Mm -hmm. beyond my own observation, but I will say this. You know, it's it's very difficult, even for somebody like me who uh, works with data and information for a living, it can be hard to trace back the origins of stories, of information, and it can be hard to validate and understand truth from misunderstanding, from intentional uh, misleading uh, information. The, The challenge right now is that I think, again, everybody wants to believe in certainty. And this has been, we want to believe in certainty because we are living in such uncertain times Previous to the election, or the thing that there were some things that led into this election, which also make it unprecedented. Let's not forget we had a global pandemic. Uh, We have a very challenging situation with uh, China that predated Trump. We have emerging, groundbreaking technologies that will fundamentally change life on Earth as we know it, and we have um, visible examples, tangible examples of climate change. There is a lot happening all at once. Those things alone would make this election cycle unprecedented. However, it is the added expectation that we have some sense of certainty over how things will turn out. And I think this time around, between information that was being spread falsely by both parties, I think, um, certainly by the the very far right wing of the Republican Party and by conspiracy theorists, um, you know, I, I think this put us in a really difficult spot. And here we are, uh, where those certainties that some people may have felt going into this, um, you know, revealed to be fairly brittle. So is there, as, as, since you're able to identify the problem, um, have you given thought to solutions? Is, can we walk back from this in any way? I think we have to make a decision that we want the future to look different. The United States does not engage in long-term planning at a national level, not in any meaningful way. And because of how our society is set up here, um, everyday people don't engage in long-term thinking either. Because we don't really think critically about the future and plan for the future, we get stuck in the minutia of what's happening right now. It's a kind of tyranny of tiny decisions that feel momentous. um, And we make a lot of them 
uh, all of the time. And again, this is in part aided by the onslaught of information we receive via algorithm. But the truth of the matter is that our government does not intentionally look many years into the future in a nonpartisan way or even a bipartisan way and reverse engineer our preferred future state to the present. We are not trained to think very long term, not in our schools. Our religious institutions don't teach us that. It's just not part of American society. So we're going to keep going through this. I mean, that's kind of the the sort of kicker here is that four years ago in 2016, after the, you know, after the electorate woke up in a daze, shocked that, that Trump had become president, Trump's camp itself was shocked that Trump had become president. Everybody thought that could never happen again. Four years later, we are in the same situation. Um, and, and that situation being people surprised that the election didn't turn out the way that they thought it would. This is a, you know, I think this election is a referendum on how the American electorate thinks about the present and the future as much as it is a referendum on the two men that we're running. And if we want to break free from this cycle, um, where we're, you know, there's so much heartache and, and so many problems, then we're going to have to do a better job of planning for the farther future. There's, there's just no other way around it. The 2020 election is unprecedented. There is no other way around it. So if we want to feel better about our elections going forward, then we have to do long-term planning. And long-term planning means an, an audit of the electoral college system. It was originally conceived to help a nation full of relatively disconnected people at the time learn more about the candidates who were running. But, you know, we're in a situation now where the way that it's used is definitely not uh, does not mesh exactly or entirely with how it was conceived. We need to give ourselves the latitude to audit that electoral college and see if it still makes sense. We need to really think through how we are using gerrymandering to further the interests of one political party over the other. We need to think through why we get so skittish about mail-in voting versus in-person voting. We need to have a long-term plan um, for validating those votes and maximizing the opportunities for people to vote. You know, it's amazing to me that we've gotten to this point in American history and we've never really audited the structures for how we elect our officials. If we want better outcomes in the future, we have to do a better job of planning. And planning isn't simply visualizing, it's backwards engineering what we want and making you know, strategic choices. It's making strategy, it's making changes in the present. Amy Webb, thank you very much. You've just made the case for the need for futurists. And uh, I, I want to thank you for taking the time and for your thoughts on this. And maybe we can look forward to having a conversation like this in four years with uh, less of a sense of, of the gloom in, in your assessment that I think that, that you're sharing today. Um, but thank you uh, again for joining us on Intelligence Squared. Thank you so much. We're going to have to take a break for just a moment, but we will be right back. Hi, everybody. Again, I'm John Donvan. And in this special post-election episode of Intelligence Squared US, I've been talking with Amy Webb, who is an author and the founder of the Future Today Institute, about whether this election that we've come through and seems still to be going through in a certain way is, is historically unprecedented and in which, which ways. But now I want to turn to a, put a different lens on this entirely by Introducing to the conversation Michael F. Holt, who is a professor of American history at the University of Virginia. Uh, Michael, thanks so much for joining us. Your your specialty uh, is American politics. You have a particular interest and have written a lot about nineteenth um, century American politics, uh, particularly the election of eighteen seventy six. And what we wanted to do with you, Michael, was was talk about that election and a few other ones to to address again this question of whether what we're going through today is really new ground, fresh territory, or in some sense or other, have we been there before? So let's start with looking at, uh, and I think these are going to be unfamiliar to most of our listeners, unless they're truly specialists, certain elections, starting with the election of 1876, you know, what happened there? And, and what does it tell us about whether or not 
in a sense, we've been down this road before. So welcome to Intelligence Squared. And Michael, what happened in 1876? <laughs> uh, well, it uh, uh, it's, was the closest election in American history in terms of the electoral vote. Uh, one vote separated the winner from the loser. Uh, it had the highest turnout uh, of any presidential election in American history, 81.8% of the eligible electorate uh, went to the polls. Uh, it pitted a, the Republican governor of Ohio, Rutherford B. Hayes, uh, against the Democratic governor of New York, Samuel J. Tilden. Uh, it was an election uh, in the midst of the worst depression uh, in the 19th century. Uh, it was uh, uh, an election characterized by uh, by massive fraud and voter intimidation uh, in, uh, of blacks in the South, uh, uh, and it ended up with uh, uh, twenty electoral votes uh, in dispute. Uh, that is, uh, states sent in uh, uh, competing. Uh, electoral votes uh, to Congress to be counted uh, when Congress met in a joint session uh, to uh, uh, count the count the electoral votes. Uh, the Twelfth Amendment uh, is unclear about exactly who could count the electoral votes, uh, and uh, at that time, like today, uh, the Democrats controlled the House uh, handily, and the Republicans controlled. Uh, the Senate. Uh, the, uh, the two parties were, were bitterly uh, divided, as were their supporters. Uh, if you read the, the letters that came in to, to Tilden, Democrats around the country uh, threatened to raise uh, armies of Union Army veterans. Uh, they, they said, we can get 100,000 men and we'll march on Washington and, and uh, use force to make sure that uh, Tilden uh, is sworn in. The incumbent president, uh, Grant, took it so seriously that uh, uh, he moved federal troops into Washington to uh, protect the Congress when it came uh, to counting things. Uh, there's one important difference to, uh, uh, of that, though, that uh, 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 the presidents then were inaugurated on March 4th, not January 20th. Uh, so it was a much longer period uh, that the country was stewing about who won the election uh, uh, than uh, what we're going to go through, presumably. Uh, the electoral colleges uh, met, met in, in December, uh, but then you had to wait until uh, March 4th, until Congress met in, in, uh, in February uh, to announce uh, who had actually won uh, the vote. Uh, so the, the country was on edge uh, for a longer period of time than I presume we're going to be uh, this year, uh, and certainly longer uh, than the 2000 election, which had the, uh, all the hanging chads and the indecision mm -hmm. about Florida. So, so how how was the 1876 election ultimately resolved? Uh, well, it, it, was un, it was an unprecedented situation, not, not to have competing electoral votes, uh, but at the time, uh, Congress, uh, well, the, the Democrats uh, believed uh, that they could challenge uh, electoral votes uh, and throw out uh, enough uh, uh, electoral votes uh, that nobody had a majority and the election would go to the House and they would count uh, Tilden in. Uh, the Republicans uh, resisted uh, uh, that interpretation. Uh, and what they did is they finally uh, uh, passed a law to create a federal electoral commission uh, that had 15 members, uh, five from the Senate, three Republicans and two Democrats, five from the House, three Democrats and two Republicans, and five from uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, associate justices of the Supreme Court, uh, they uh, they named four uh, associate justices, two Democrats and two Republicans. Everybody knew that partisanship would be play here, and the assumption was that uh, the law called for these four 
uh, to pick a fifth associate justice. Uh, it was assumed uh, that they, they would pick a justice named David Davis, who was the one independent, true independent, nonpartisan judge on the court. Uh, but the night before uh, uh, the, the uh, Congress was going to vote on creating this commission, uh, telegraph, uh, telegrams arrived from Illinois saying that the, the Democrats in the Illinois state legislature had elected Davis to, uh, to the Senate from Illinois in an attempt to sway his vote on the commission. Uh, Davis then announced that uh, now that he was a senator-elect, he, he couldn't be impartial and refused to sit on the commission. And they got a Republican, uh, another Republican justice. And so by a, a vote of eight to seven, all 20 electoral votes that were in dispute were awarded uh, to uh, uh, Rutherford Hayes, uh, this finally lasted till March 2nd, uh, and uh, at about five in the morning uh, on March 2nd, uh, and Hayes was inaugurated on March 5th. So the country had to wait uh, from uh, for really three, uh, three almost four months uh, to find out uh, whom had been elected. And, and as part of Part of this outcome, I understand also there was a, a deal made regarding reconstruction and federal troops in the South, that, uh, that the, a price that the Democrats demanded was that basically reconstruction come to an end and federal troops pull out of the Southern states that they've been occupying since the Civil War. So a sense that, you know, African Americans kind of got screwed again as, as a result of this. So, Michael, it, it seems as though, let's let's even put aside the 1860 election where Abraham Lincoln was running and it was the run-up to the Civil War and certainly led to an incredibly divisive, destructive, deadly outcome. But even in 1876, we are seeing back then, you know, those 124 years ago, um, a, a, a polarization and... and uh, a mutual anger and distrust that suggests to me that we have seen this kind of polarization before that we're going through now. It's not so new in American history. Well, uh, yeah, and of course you you mentioned uh, uh, polarization in spades in, in 1860 uh, when uh, the Deep South refused to accept the election of a Republican uh, as president is legitimate and, and, and seceded uh, rather than stick around and be... Uh, 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 ruled uh, by a black Republican, as they uh, uh, called uh, the Republicans. So uh, the polarization today is not unprecedented. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm persuaded that the technology today that was used in the election uh, is in fact unprecedented, uh, but certainly not the polarization uh, in the electorate. I want to look at one other election with you that, again, people may not know about, and that's um, when the Constitution sets up a kind of Plan B or Plan C for how our president is elected, and one of those, one of those uh, uh, instruments is the uh, is the resort to a, a vote by the House of Representatives. Uh, the Constitution dictates that when there is no candidate that has a majority of electoral college votes, uh, or there's a tie, that the House of Representatives would actually be the body that chooses the next president of the United States. And it sounds like a, the thing is, it sounds far-fetched, but it happened in 1800. So can you tell us briefly that story? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, the election of 1800 is why the 12th Amendment uh, to the Constitution was ever passed. Uh, it's because at that time, uh, uh, originally the Constitution said uh, that uh, 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 the person who comes in second in the electoral vote in the presidential election will be the vice president. Uh, well, there were political parties by then, the Jeffersonian Republican Party. Uh, it ran Thomas Jefferson uh, for the president and Aaron Burr for vice president. Uh, but the, <laughs> uh, the, the electors pledged to them didn't get the message that they should not give them both the same vote. So they ended up, both Burr and, and Jefferson, in ended up in a tie uh, and the same party. Uh, and 
Uh, we know from Hamilton that Aaron Burr was a sort of sly uh, uh, guy. Uh, but so the House had to choose uh, between uh, Burr and Jefferson. Uh, each state had one vote. Uh, Federalists who controlled some states uh, were tempted to throw it to Burr. They so hated Jefferson. Uh, but Hamilton, to his credit, uh, uh, he was still alive then, uh, intervened. He was no longer in the government uh, to persuade uh, the Federalists uh, to give the vote uh, to Jefferson uh, rather than to Burr. Uh, and Burr became vice president instead. Uh, in 1854, there were four candidates, uh, so nobody had a majority, and the top three uh, went to the House. Uh, uh, Andrew Jackson, John Quincy Adams, uh, uh, and uh, uh, William H. Crawford uh, finished uh, uh, were, the, were the top three. Uh, Henry Clay had run in that election, but he came in fourth uh, in the electoral vote. But he was Speaker of the House, and he persuaded enough people uh, in state delegations to vote for Adams. So John Quincy Adams was elected president uh, that time. So, Michael, the question that, that I want to put about the bo- both of these two elections we've talked about in the framework of today is, um, you know, we're, we're at a very contentious time. There is, as Amy Webb was saying, a great deal of unease in general, but I think it's going to be exacerbated by the election that we've come through and are still experiencing. And there's a sort of, you know, will we ever come out of this? And by that, I mean, will we ever return to some semblance of consensus, a political comity, uh, a a reduction in the polarization. And you've described for us, certainly after 1876, a time in which uh, there was enormous polarization. And then at some point, there wasn't. And I want to ask you, you know, what is your prognosis based on what you saw happen in 1876 for us kind of getting past this? What is it what is, re- what is it required? I hate to use the word healing, so I'm going to strike that from my vocabulary for this purpose, but a kind of coming together and a cooling of tensions and an ability to, to function once again as a political society. What happened after 1876 to calm things down? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, uh, among other things, the, uh, the federal government then did very little. Uh, and, uh, and so it really didn't make that much difference except uh, uh, to those few southern states that the uh, Republicans still controlled. I mean, Reconstruction was already over in, in the vast majority uh, of the Confederate uh, states. Um, uh, uh, so the country calmed down. Uh, I'd, I'd like to read, though, if, uh, if I, you'll indulge me, uh, mm-hmm. what... Uh, uh, Rutherford Hayes said in his uh, inaugural address about uh, the country, I think it was uh, trying to uh, uh, gild the lily a little bit, but he uh, he talked about this commission, which again uh, didn't finish its work until two days before the presidential inauguration and giving all 20 disputed votes uh, to Hayes so that he won the election 185 to 184 in the Electoral College. Uh, uh, But uh, Hayes uh, refers to the work of this Electoral Commission, uh, and he said it was entitled uh, to the fullest confidence of the American people. Its decisions have been patiently waited for and accepted as conclusive by the general judgment of the public, for the present opinion will very widely as to the wisdom of the several conclusions announced uh, by that tribunal. Uh, This is to be anticipated in every instance where matters of dispute are made a subject of arbitration under the forms of law. Human judgment is never unerring and is rarely regarded as otherwise than wrong by the unsuccessful party in the contest. The fact that the two great political parties have in this way settled a dispute in which good men differ as to the facts and the law, no less than as to the proper course to be pursued in solving the question is, uh, in the question in controversy, uh, is an occasion for general rejoicing. Upon one point, 
there is entire unanimity in public sentiment that conflicting claims to the presidency must be amicably and peaceably uh, adjusted, and that when all and, and that when so adjusted, the general acquiescence of the nation is sure to follow. Uh, and by and large, uh, that was true uh, at that time. Uh, whether this is a preview of what happens today, uh, I'm not so sure. So that was that, that was language that that Rutherford Hayes inserted into his inaugural address to kind of yeah, that is that is correct. I'd like to bring Amy Webb back into the conversation. She's been listening, and and, and as we wrap up the conversation, since you have both heard what each other has to say on the topic of whether we're in unprecedented times, Amy, I note that that Michael t- totally agrees with you that the social media impact is uh, is new and different. He disagrees a little bit about whether the polarization is necessarily anything new, nor does he necessarily think it's unsur- unsurvivable, which is also your opinion, I think, on that. But uh, I, I'd like to, you know, he quoted Rutherford B. Hayes as sort of setting the right note for let's all getting along. But do you see, Amy, from what you've heard and, and perhaps in reference to uh, what Michael had to say, um, are, are a way out of this, a, a, you know, a getting along? Do you, do you see this tension and polarization something that will be dialed back? You've already told us it can be, perhaps, but will be dialed back in, say, the next by the time the next election rolls around. Sure. I'd actually, in response, like to quote the great American retailer, The Gap, uh, in saying, we can get through it together. Imagine those words emblazoned in a hoodie that is half blue and half red. Um, I'm saying, I'm not making that up. That was a tweet that got sent (laughs) earlier in the day today. And to me, this is indicative of the challenge that we're facing ahead. We have lots of voices in the fray. We see very little substantive action on behalf of the companies that create the tools to enable us to freely share information. And we know that the systems that those platforms use were designed to retain our attention. If it's the case that we don't like the current situation where we are not getting along and our polarization is on the rise, not the wane, then we have to accept that the ship is not going to right itself on its own. Um, You know, Michael, I think, rightly pointed out that throughout history, there have been plenty of examples of rancor and polarization and great arguments around politics. That's natural. What's unnatural is using technology to amplify the differences that we share and and doing that for the purpose of earning, uh, earning revenue, which is why these systems were designed the way they were. So if our expectation is that the future will organically sort itself out and we're all going to get along at some point, like the gap hopes, I think we're going to be waiting indefinitely. If it's the case that we would prefer to feel a lot less stress um, and figure out a way to have meaningful uh, conversations with our neighbors and relatives where we can disagree without feeling like we need to attack each other, then we're going to have to take many more active measures in the present. You think it's an uphill fight to get to that point, it sounds like. I think it is, it is a, a, a battle that cannot be won unless we summon the courage and the self-discipline to make some difficult choices. And Michael, I want to give you the last word on this by phrasing it this way. Um, is it your view that this too shall pass? Or do you agree with Amy that this is an especially steep hill we have to climb if we want to get back to something that feels like the normal we used to know. Uh, I don't think we're going to get back to <laughs> to normal easily. All right. So the two of you agree on that. And I, I want to thank you for the two kinds of lenses you brought to this complicated moment. It was fascinating to, to put the two of you together. And, and, and I appreciate your hearing each other out and finding ways to agree with one another as well. So thank you, uh, Michael F. Holt and Amy Webb to both of you for joining us on Intelligence Squared. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, And I want to let you know, to learn more about Intelligence Squared, you can visit us online at iq2us.org. 
That's IQ, the number two, us.org. And I, I also want to tell you that as, as we all continue uh, dealing with the challenges of doing what we do during a pandemic, we at Intelligence Squared are working at it, at keeping to continue putting out thought-provoking and engaging content. And we're going to be continuing to do that with our regular programming soon. And on that note, I would like to recruit your participation in something that we'll be doing soon. We're going to be putting on another debate in our program that we uh, produce with Bloomberg Television, the program That's Debatable. It's also sponsored by IBM. Uh, And in the upcoming episode, we're going to be addressing a question that arises out of all of the stimulus spending that we've seen throughout the pandemic to try to keep uh, folks afloat, well, it's running up a big bill in the trillions, uh, not just in the U.S., in Europe and around the globe, leading to enormous uh, deficits and huge increases in the national debt. And the question we want to address is sort of so what? Should we be worried about it? Specifically, should we stop worrying about national deficits. Is there a case to be made, just keep spending, that that's the way out and worry about this problem later? So that's where we would like you to weigh in. If you go to iq2us.org, you'll find a way to upload your point of view on this in the form of an argument. And we will make sure that it's included in our debate. Again, the question is, should we stop worrying about national deficits? If you go to iq2us.org, we want to hear from you. We want to hear your thoughts on this, and we will find a way to weave it into our debate. So thank you for that. Um, I just want to let you know that this special episode series is brought to you by Intelligence Squared U.S. Debates. We recorded on November 4th, 2020. Our debates are generously funded by listeners like you and by the Rosencrantz Foundation. Claire Connor is our CEO. David Ariosto is head of editorial. Amy Kraft is chief of staff. Shay O'Mara is consulting producer. Connor Kerfman is our creative and marketing strategist. Jennifer Zelmer is senior researcher. Damon Whittemore is the radio producer. Robert Rosencrantz is our chairman. And I'm your host, John Donvan, saying thank you so much for listening.